Hey, William. Hey, William, how are you? I'm great. I'm sorry. I just dropped my camera. <laughs> no, no, no problem. Hi, William. Um, nice meeting you again. Yeah. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, we, we are live now. And so assume that people will join um, according to the interest group. And there are certainly a number of sessions going at the same time. So I did post a notice about half an hour ago just to kind of set out the agenda. And uh, hopefully they'll join more audience. Now we've got four people, so we do have some audience uh, joining us. So we just started. How about that, William? Yeah, sure. No problem. And Sean. And uh, Joy has some issue getting on, and hopefully she <laughs> will get on accordingly. Uh, Harry cannot make it. So some last-minute emergency, so we'll miss him. And never heard from Jasper, so we'll just hopefully he'll join. But we'll just uh, forward what we had, and we'll do our best to provide some feedback in the next 45 minutes. You guys ready? Sure. Yeah. Great, nice great. Chat. We yeah. have William here, so I think, you know, we're all set. Right, great. So welcome, everyone. Um, we are running a session on the U.S.-China technology contest. And first, I'd like to pose it as more like a question of a question, right? Is, is it a real question to ask? Is the contest real? And is it just a myth or is it reality? So I'd like to have our panel members uh, come in and really discuss a little bit more about their personal thinking. Um, but we assume that the audience have enough background on their own. So this is more more uh, a discussion rather than educational sessions about current world events. So we, given the assumptions, I think we hope that we can move forward uh, to make this panel discussion a lot more uh, effective and useful for everyone who could participate and join us. And if you have any questions, please feel free to text it in the text box or flat me. So I can have you uh, get the mic and present your question and your, your viewpoint. And everyone's input is certainly welcome. And let me start. Uh, my name is Stan Fung uh, with uh, Farsight Ventures. And I'm an angel uh, venture capital investor uh, in both U.S. and China. So I've been doing venture capital for uh, quite a while, a, a long time. And so our focus is really look at global startups, anyone in the world who have an interest to create a global business. And you can start from China, you can start from U.S. or anywhere else. But their business tend to be more global in nature. And of course, by, by definition, you include China as part of that landscape. And so we try to follow what's going on around the globe very closely on an on a effective basis. And then William, go ahead and introduce yourself and give your perspective, and then Sean can do next. Yeah, sure. So I've been doing tech investment 25 years, um, mostly in Asia, uh, but uh, to do five years in the U.S., uh, first 11 in equity research, and now um, I guess the last 13, 14 years in early stage venture capital. Uh, so SOSV, uh, we're an early stage VC fund with $900 million under management. Uh, we're very active. Uh, so... Uh, and global and multiple verticals, uh, hardware, biotech, and I run internet and software. So we invest in about 140 companies per year. We have over a thousand companies in the portfolio. Uh, and um, for cross-border internet and software, we're helping companies from around the world uh, go cross-border to Asia. Uh, most of our portfolio is in Asia and we're helping them go cross-border within Asia. Uh, so China in, China out. Uh, we started the first accelerator in Asia, first in China, China Accelerator, uh, 11 years ago, uh, and uh, mostly helping international companies, startups enter China, but also China out. Uh, we are active in working with about 230 multinationals, uh, and uh, 42 of them uh, where we're doing uh, um, uh, basically bridging uh, between startups and these multinationals to bring international uh, um uh, hard tech and deep tech and solutions from startups to the corporates. Uh, and uh, and so uh, most people think, you know, go to China and sell to Chinese companies. Uh, we found that for at least for international startups is a lot uh, easier, better and faster uh, to go to China and actually sell to multinationals. Uh, so uh, uh, so that gives us a kind of a unique uh, perspective. Uh, and uh, we've helped, uh, you know, 100, over 100 uh, companies enter China. Thanks. Hi, Sean. Uh, so thanks, Stan and uh, William. So I'm Sean. Um, I lead an independent research firm called Planum China. 
so we cover Chinese financial markets, macroeconomics, as well as politics and policy uh, with a specific focus on China's personnel changes at both uh, elite and uh, local levels. Uh, so before starting this research company, um, I worked at the World Bank for two years, where I'm, um, I'm still a consultant to the Women Entrepreneurs Finance Initiative. So I guess that's my sort of connection still to the startup and to the uh, to the entrepreneurship world. Uh, and before that, I uh, worked for former U.S. President Jimmy Carter for six years as his China assistant at the Carter Center. Uh, so back then, you know, my role was mostly uh, in, you know, sort of a think tank and uh, China-U.S. exchange uh, programs design and implementation. Um, so, uh, yeah, happy to, to I guess, have a, a chat about, you know, uh, how we see the uh, tech competition or in general, the China-U.S. rivalry uh, under this new era. Okay, great. Um, I know a few other members um, are not joining us yet, but I want them at China. We joined 10, tried to get in. Um, so hopefully she'll join us along the way. Uh, but as I mentioned, as, as we start, we, we you know, there's some new joiners uh, after we uh, started the program. Uh, our goal is to really try to move the panel discussion one step further, but then being educational, we assume that you all are global citizens, you follow events globally. So up to speed about some of the current discussions around the globe. I, I keep saying the globe because at the end of the day, you know, if you look at technology development, it's the global landscape, right? We cannot exclude European unions, countries, because they want to be a leading technology platform. Well, a lot of you know, innovations come from Europe and and a lot of use of the technology apply to other countries around the globe, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, all included in this technology landscape. So by talking about U.S. and China on its own, I think it's a bit limited. And, and as our um, slogan goes, you know, we really are global visionary communities that harass us. So we like to think about ourselves being the leading thinkers about how we address global issues rather than just look at it as a challenge. So in that respect, I think we're going to talk about some myth and reality. Uh, I will start with one example and then I'll let Sean and William bring in their example. At the end, I think there's a lot of political discussion going on in uh, the press, uh, from governments, from multinationals, but the reality is, I think both US and China have similar objectives. You know, we both want to develop our technology landscape. We want to be moving advanced uh, in, in four steps to create innovations that we can use ourselves and also uh, around the globe. Uh, there's uh, security issues, the um, uh, investigating big companies, uh, are all meant to really provide an open platform for their protection, uh, means to kind of open up the market for competitions while being dominated by big companies. I mean, actually, I'd say in general terms, but if you bring one level down about the names involved, it's a similar idea, right? So I think both countries and others uh, really have a want and desire to protect data for citizens, for general public, to create a market, open market landscape to encourage entrepreneurship and small business formations. But when it comes to the messages in the media and from the government somehow become different. <laughs> um, their protection is called um, controlling the masses in China. It's called protecting consumers in the U.S. and around in the Western communities. So why? It's the same objective, but it's labeled differently. So this is my first example of myth, where we all hear the messages being controversial, but the reality is we are meant to be good citizens to what we do for those citizens. So it's my first example. So I'll let William and Sean kind of bring their example and then come back and have a frank discussion. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, regulation's uh, interesting. Uh, we have, uh, you know, love unintended consequences. Uh, so, uh, you know, for GDPR, the idea was to protect privacy. The unintended consequence was that, you know, big internet companies used uh, the threat of GDPR to scare uh, advertisers away from smaller, medium-sized, and startups. 
uh, and uh, and really uh, use it to crush competition. Uh, so in, in China, you've had a, a very I would say open market um, where there's very little regulation to start, especially in new areas of technology and development. Uh, and then uh, very quickly, just because it's a very kind of capitalist, extremely competitive uh, environment to, you know, you, you get market consolidation very, very quickly. Uh, and then once there's like five or six or seven or eight players, uh, then the, the government sort of engages with those players. And usually what happens is they come together uh, to form a consensus around what the the you neo know, regulation will be, or that's oftentimes not written down in black and white. Um, what's happened recently, though, is that you've got a duopoly situation where you know if you're an Alibaba group, you can't um, you really play with uh, Tencent and vice versa, um, and uh, that has hurt competition. Uh, and uh, so, competition generally drives economic development, uh, and so the government, to some extent, has stepped in. Uh, to um, uh, open things up a bit uh, and, uh, and 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 tell people, hey, you can't have two camps. You know, we want more competition. We want more economic growth. And now we'll see how this plays out. Um, so on the one side, you could look at it as as uh, government control uh, uh, hitting entrepreneurs, but the Alibaba camp and Tencent camp are so big uh, at this point that they're uh, it's a virtual duopoly. Uh, and uh, and if uh, you know, my, my view is if China really wants to continue seeing uh, that economic growth on the consumer side, they do need to to step in and, and open this up a bit uh, because China started off as much more open than the U.S. on the commercial front, uh, and now it's actually increasingly more closed, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons why I think the the government's uh, stepping in uh, on the on the cons- on the commercial side. Uh, to um, to to dictate or mandate to industry uh, that they cannot uh, enforce these two uh, the camp like structures. So, thanks, mm-hmm. uh, Sean. Um, I think you know. I first of all, I agree with everything that William just said. I think you know, for the Chinese market, um, I think Stan wanted us to give a couple of examples. Like my example would be the recent um, crackdown, uh, if you will, on the education, the online education sector. Uh, you know, China had this really boom in terms of online education startups in 2020 with COVID-19, uh, with the pandemic. And um, I don't have the exact number in front of me, but I think the venture capital investment into education startups basically skyrocketed in just one year. Uh, and then you, know, you have a lot of issues with Xi Jinping uh, highlighting the issue of excessive sort of after school tutoring and um, a plethora of education startups that are really creating in a way a bit of social inequality and uh, limiting upward mobility where the, the, the wealthy families can afford uh, you know all kinds of af- after school tutoring and um, the have nots don't really have the the opportunity so that is something that I think the government is taking note of and that just shows uh, the, the priorities of the, the the government, right, in terms of uh, the direction it wants to push for the private sector and for the internet sector, uh, and also, you know, China. I think in the next maybe couple of weeks uh, might be passing the personal information protection law, and you you already seen the China uh, the Cyberspace Administration of China, the CAC, uh, you know, firing basically warning shots targeted at over a hundred apps uh, in, you know, everything ranging from like instant messenger to like, you know, your financial apps to um, like the content aggregators, uh, you know, asking them to self-correct with their information protection uh, and their personal information collection uh, mechanisms. So, you know, with all these said, I think, you know, there is a sort of a shift in paradigm where um, uh, China, the Chinese government at least, is trying to uh, dial back uh, the sort of, you know, on the, the free growth uh, or the free ring kind of model for the internet sector and trying to bring more discipline uh, to the market. Uh, and I'll also quickly touch on, I guess, another uh, sort of myth versus reality in the international scale. Uh, you know, today, I think the Senate is going to, the U.S. Senate is going to um, uh uh, debate the the uh, Innovation and Competitiveness Act of 2021, and this is basically a uh, you know an all inclusive package that 
that that that uh, you know promises you know hundreds of billions of dollars funding in the U.S. innovation sector uh, in competition with China. So, you know, one could say that this is a lot of this is all hype. This is all you know sort of you know investing in the special interest groups, investing in uh, you know organizations like National Science Foundation. Uh, that's not going to have a real impact on the actual businesses in the, tech, the technology sector. Uh, but the counter argument would be, uh, and which is what I actually believe the, as a reality, is that you know the the divide between the U.S. and Chinese tech ecosystem is sort of inevitable. You know, these two countries or the two ecosystems are built uh, on fundamentally different. Um, ideas and uh, the concept of uh, data and technology sovereignty is so drastically different in these two countries that companies will have to, uh, you know, create basically separate systems, se- separate R and D uh, teams, separate legal teams, and separate everything, and to localize entirely in each country, in each in, in these two very different ecosystems. I mean, Tesla uh, and how it's basically bumping into uh, all these kind of um, uh, like Great Wall, basically in China, is another example. Uh, um, so, yeah, so that's my you know very sort of quick and dirty take on on the so-called myth versus reality. I mean, I think the competition is real. I think the rivalry is real, uh, and the two sort of parallel ecosystems will probably become more uh, salient uh, in the next couple of years. Right. I think Sean, William, Robert, a few good points and. I'll summarize in, in a couple of uh, situation analysis. One is really, I don't even think that is always forgotten in this discussion around the globe is that China is 40, 40 50 years behind uh, US and US, European unions in terms of technology development. And so there's always a forgotten uh, issue. It's not the same plate. And China went through th- three stages of tech development from just innovation in the early 2000s to the you know, 2006 to 2020, where they try to promote indigenous uh, innovations. And now going forward, I think the theme has always been more self-standing and self-sufficient, self-strong provisions. So it's a logical if I were in in the government's shoes that if you start from uh, 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 around in the 1990s and you're catching up the rest of the world. The kind of three-step progression make a lot of sense. And so if you take that landscape and compare with the U.S. development, which started way after World War II, so it's 40 years ahead of China. So in that understanding, uh, given the different approaches and different origins of the approach, I think Sean's comments about uh, the outcome could be two parallel paths of development, which are already uh, evident in the last 20 years the blockage of some Western innovations in China and going forward in blockchain development, which is a cryptocurrency development. And you may end up going along parallel path. And this is where we like to really move forward in a discussion, given that understanding of a potential parallel development, uh, given the different philosophies and approaches and different stages of technology development, as um, in, in industrialists, investors, multinational corporations, if you see that landscape, how do you approach it so that you benefit yourself uh, and you participate correctly? And keep in mind that we also uh, want to make sure that everyone knows the rest of the world has a lot to say and a lot of influence in that direction as well. Because each one of the multinationals and countries eventually have to decide their own path and pick a side if they have to. Hi, Joy. Welcome. Hey, sorry. The technical issues Hi. had what to get through the hurdles. <laughs> okay, no, no problem. Yeah, we are actually just started talking about the myth and reality, and we and welcome your input to see if you have an example from your entrepreneurial background and being involved in both countries. And then we'd like to move forward to provide some advice to the audience, uh, to the people who listen to the video afterwards on how to deal with the issue if they were multinationals or SMBs or entrepreneurs or as investors. So go ahead, Joy, introduce yourself and provide your input. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Joy. I'm the founder of an 
AI shopping startup that making all the content organic social media content shoppable. So we're in the social commerce, um, you know, runway. And uh, right now we're in both China and U.S. We actually, the company originally is a U.S. company, and we launched with two of China's biggest social media platform. One of, uh, you know, one of is China's Facebook. The other one is China's YouTube. Yeah, I think, you know, um, definitely last year when COVID hit um, and, you know, the U.S.-China <laughs> trade wars uh, was affected. And But I think, you know, it's interestingly, as soon as um, Biden became the president, we immediately received funding, <laughs> a decent amount of funding. I think it has a little to do with, you know, people's perceptions of, you know, the political landscape. And um, actually, we're not affected business-wise. You know, the, the Chinese clients has never treated us differently because of U.S.-China trade war. Actually, even in China, people were still saying that if you're a U.S. startup, you actually naturally get that glory effect because <laughs> mm-hmm. you know, U.S. is better with AI technology. You know, we pay more attention to the details of automations while in China they still pay more attention to uh, operations you know and the business business operations so it's different style um, um, I do think you know definitely the clients ask us a lot of questions that we have clients in Japan too we have clients in Korea a lot of them ask this question like how do we separate the data you know we naturally always always run a server in the, in the U.S., separate server and a separate server in China. You know, in China, we're in Alibaba Cloud. In the U.S., we're on AWS Cloud to keep, you know, the user data completely separate. And also, we don't keep any sensitive privacy data. They're mostly just retail-related behavioral uh, retail data, which is considered not sensitive in any countries. Yeah. Great, great. So, <laughs> as, you, as you know, uh, so that we got to parallel development with tech platform. And then we do have someone like Joy overstep a video the same way. We overstep in both countries in our innovation investments. So we always uh, uh, aware that at the end, you know, in China, you always set away from certain sensitive areas because it's so centralized to the administration of the country. And so you the same way, right? And so we tend to, look at the consumer sectors uh, as a start and then migrate over to some of the overlapping areas uh, as much as possible. But the question really becomes, as we go forward, uh, how do we handle the situation as outsiders, right? As the participants. Mm-hmm. But let me start and I will go around the panel members and get their input as well. And I would like to focus on the government side uh, because I spent a couple of years at Kennedy School, so I got involved in policy level discussions among the uh, players in both countries. By the end, I think government has a role to play in all this. At the end, I think government is more establishing policies and standards and incentives. There's really the major role of the government, right? You get policy settings and get incentive structure by rules and regulations to allow the participants like us to play by the rules. And But if the government step in and start to pick um, champions and they tend to be a little bit difficult. And it's not just happening in China, it's just happening in the US as well. You cannot really get in and pick winners and successful companies because the people who are involved in that decision tend to be non-technologists, uh, non-entrepreneurial, and so they tend to have a different kind of senses on what make it work. So I encourage government to really stay with the area of focus, and there's a lot to do right there as is, and let the market um, in all countries, determine its outcomes. And so, I don't know, I'll just take a roll, roll call according to the direction yeah. of the screen. Where do them go next? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, uh, no, I think uh, that would be great. I think that is going to be difficult to achieve. Um, I mean, for many years, um, you know, in the early days, multinationals in China had uh, had a lot of benefits. Uh, and, uh, but, uh you know, the government put the finger on the scale to try and help the, the local players. Um, at this point, uh, the, there's less government support of the local players. The local players have uh, more funding. Um, they move faster, and they're generally uh, more capable than the multinationals operating in China. The multinationals are generally getting their butts kicked right now. Uh, and uh, the government, to, for, the most, for the most part, is not actually that involved. Um, now, 
70 plus percent of venture capital uh, in China is coming from governments, but it's not coming from central. It's coming from local development funds, uh, very decentralized, very spread out. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of the myths is that there's some sort of monolithic government. It's almost like uh, more like city state in the U.S. Uh, where, where everybody is kind of independent and not really it's even more independent um because in the u.s you have parties and in in uh in china it's every district and every city for themselves every province for themselves almost uh so i, I would say um where 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 uh, it would be like sort of nice if there were rules and and, and open playing field uh in china you're seeing that but uh, it's uh, but the competition is intense, and while uh, China in some areas like semiconductors is behind, in other areas like consumer and implementation of AI, uh, they're far ahead because uh, uh, it's not you know AI is not just about uh, models; it's about data. Uh, and no matter how good your model is, if you don't have the data, uh, it doesn't work. So the actual use of AI is much uh, more prevalent in, the, in in China than say the U.S. Uh, and, and so there's, um, if you want to call it a contest, sure. Uh, there, there's definitely uh, a decoupling that's happened. Uh, and uh, I don't think there's much we can do about that at this point. It's a reality. Um, but uh, uh, but uh, in terms of uh, the, you know, China as the number one consumer market in the world, multinationals do not have a choice. They need to be there. How can they be competitive? Uh, and that's, I think, a, a big question. Uh, and we can get into that if you want to, uh, but it is very, very difficult. And, and we're working with, um, you know, over 200 multinationals uh, uh, and helping them uh, uh, try and uh, actually survive in, in China in this very competitive market. Mm-hmm. Hey, Joy. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I think a uh, very interesting observation, Alan, and actually we, in China, like we have to, you know, have a China team. You know, we have a China CEO we have a China CTO. We we operate very locally, and in fact, that we actually have a legal structure where <laughs> we have a completely independent Chinese company um, uh, against you know our U.S. company, um, even though they are all under the same umbrella. But we keep them operationally, legally, completely separate. And you are exactly right. There's um, a lot of government funding and even you know at the moment we're you know we're working with multiple government funding companies application companies there's lots of them they, they help you know startups to apply for government funding and it appears that we're qualified um, and then I also agree that you know the data is very important um, that's how you store your data it's interestingly you know when I was in China US people normally don't ask me how you store your data. Because uh, in in China, you you ob- obviously you have to store data in on the Chinese cloud. Otherwise, you know you can't get across the uh, the China firewall. The latency is really high, um, and the U.S. people never ask that. Also, but the the ones that typically ask me is like our clients from Japan and Korea. They tend to be like the more um, conservative, the more uh, worried <laughs> with mm. the U.S. China trade war. Um, so yeah, like. Um, I, I definitely think, you know, there are still successful examples in multinational companies entering China. But normally, you know, I actually have a few startup friends of mine. They're, you know, English speaking and they ask me if I can help them get into China. And uh, my answer is normally no, because I don't have the energy <laughs> to help them. <laughs> and uh, also, I, I really felt like if the founder doesn't speak or maybe a C-level person doesn't speak fluent Mandarin, it will have so much difficulties entering a foreign country. Yeah, mm-hmm. and I, I'm a natural, you know, I'm a fluent Mandarin speaker. I actually spent half my life in China, and then I came to the States for college at MIT. So um, for me, like, I... When I'm in China, I just act like a you know uh, a native person that, <laughs> that uh, doesn't appear to be foreignized. Like most people just uh, assume that I live in China, but really I'm you know I'm I'm actually traveling back and forth. Mm-hmm. So I think there's um uh, there's still a lot of uh, success cases, and if we look at you know other success cases like LVMH, you know like. Uh, you know, like these um, luxury brands in China, they're actually still thriving. I would say they're doing better in China than in any other country. They're, most of the growth is actually still generated from China. I think that says a lot about, 
you know, the Chinese consumer, actually the income inequality is dividing. Um, almost 90% of the transaction, you know, purchases are done by, you know, the top, uh, pretty much top 1% of the Chinese <laughs> consumers. So I think there's still, um, and these Chinese consumers, for some reason, they still are very thirsty for foreign products. Uh, that said, even though we're in China, that actually most of the product we sell are, you know, from our local clients like Alibaba, you know, JD, uh, Pinduoduo, and we also have, you know, foreign brands like, you know, Farfetch and LVMH. But we do see that, you know, they're still, uh, the high-end consumer are still very attached to high-end products globally. So I think there's definitely room. And you see LVMH, you know, that they joined venture with Alibaba before. Um, so I think a lot of the global multinational companies also, first of all, trying to solve the legal entity problem. Right? It's like, how can I have like a Chinese legal entity? So I don't get, you know, my butt kicked. <laughs> and that's a very good point. Actually, let me add to what Joe was saying. It's applied the other way as well. Uh, we deal with a lot of Chinese firms yeah. going global, which is a lot of ambitious. Uh, ambitions behind the entrepreneurs in China. They want to build a firm that's global in, in, in nature. And they're doing the same thing when they go into foreign market in Europe, in South America, or in the US. They have to go hire a local uh, team so that be localized uh, in the services and part offerings. And so the landscape is very similar in both directions. So I they encourage uh, Chinese entrepreneurs to think that way as well. Hi, Sean. Uh, any additional comments and on the top? Yeah, no, I, I just wanted to, uh, you know, echo what Joy just said. I think, uh, indeed, you know, for a new sort of batch of startups to start working in China, they really have to set up everything locally, right? And, uh, you know, I have a, uh, another company uh, that helps Chinese brands expand overseas in overseas markets. So we help them with digital marketing, uh, with their brand building, and a little bit of public affairs and government relations. <laughs> And, uh, you know, from what we've been seeing, there is a very strong sort of desire or, or, or flexibility within these companies to the so-called to, you know, de-Chinization, right? So, like, they mm -hmm. want to appear global. They want to appear Western. They don't have to, uh, you know, contrary to U.S. or, I guess, Western perception, they don't have to always defend, like, the Chinese uh, culture or the Chinese uh, uh, origin of their brand, right? They want to be global, but if you look at uh, Western brands in China, the you know very few sort of Western brands are willing to or are capable of be becoming completely local, right? And that's you know both from uh, the companies themselves and from the consumers side, right? As Joy mentioned, a lot of the high-end shoppers that still value you know, Western brands and Western uh, uh, culture. So, you know, I think in that sort of context, you are going to have, like, you know, we discussed earlier, sort of parallel ecosystems. But in the same time, the fact that the markets are so attractive, you know, to companies in both China and the U.S., uh, it's really hard for them to completely uh, sort of just, you know, give up. Uh, you know, they will find a way, the private sector will find a way to still make things work, right? Given these very stringent and uh, uh, seemingly, you know, hopeless regulations and rivalry. Uh, so yeah, no, I just wanted to really agree with everything that Joy and William just said. Yes, and um, you know, one step further as well. Um, at the end, um, I mean, there are two ways. I mean, we all agree that at the end, competition is always good. Uh, just even domestically in any country, competition create innovations, create a market-driven outcomes that allow us consumers to get the best product and services available. But at the end, among countries, among corporations, especially on the multinational and supranational level, like the bill, um, TCs, um, and I, IFC, I, you know, World Bank angle, then there are three ways to look at how we do things together. There are really competitions in some cases, uh, collaboration in the others, and cooperation in the third. And my suggestion is you need to think about area of focus. Like when it comes to technology innovations, I think competition makes sense because each one has a customized needs, customized ideas on how to build certain product. But at the end, which is what the second one comes in, collaborations among countries. Because for us to really 
get the outcome and the results and use it effectively, the interface among them, the standards among them, should be put together on a global scale so that in the case of blockchain, there will be a number of blockchain of chains, right? And they'll interface together. BSN in China is developed the same way, and there was more there was the same way. So that and the interface is important. And this is where the international organization comes in to help standardize it. And the third area of uh, cooperation, there's an area we have to cooperate in terms of vaccine development, in terms of climate change, because even if we don't, each country's outcome is influenced by the others, but affect the others just by the flow of air, right? By the flow of mm-hmm. traffic. And so, I mean, I encourage everyone to think three areas and more than just competition on its own, collaboration and corporations make sense in certain cases. So just apply all three where it applies. Go ahead, uh, William, any add on comments? Yeah, sure. I think, um, um, I don't think people should have too many illusions about, uh, uh, about uh, uh, cooperation. I mean, um, I think the, in the U.S. Uh, generally, at least historically, because I haven't lived in the U.S. for a long time, but there's always this thing uh, where you're supposed to focus on one thing and do it well. Um, and uh, just in consumer internet, you know, the model has been more a media-based model, uh, where you, um, you know, you have a lot of users, and then you you pay uh, people pay a fee, brands pay a fee to get access to those users. Whereas in, in China, it's a different model where you have a bunch of users, um, but the the companies, the platforms are are taking a revenue share. Um, so advertising is less of a, of a market now. Um, you know, in Asia, we have something called a super app where these internet companies are basically doing everything. Uh, and so the U.S. companies are so far behind in this kind of super app concept, but they've, they've been catching up. So Facebook's business model, their, their product roadmap has been a clone of like WeChat for the last five, six years. They're trying to catch up. Um, but this super app concept uh, is really going to have an interesting effect globally because you have very large companies doing everything. Now, I'll give you an example in, in health. Um, so some of the biggest health companies in the world, you probably don't know, are Alibaba, Tencent. There's also uh, Ping An. Uh, and um, they're vertically integrated. So they, they own uh, the end customer. They own the distribution. They own uh, basically the medical records. They're integrated with the hospitals. And I'm talking about inter- Alibaba and Tencent. Um, and they're invested in uh, uh, venture capital funds, investing in, in drugs and therapeutics. Uh, so if you talk to the drug companies or we work with a, a lot of the drug companies, you know, they're in big trouble. Uh, big pharma is in big trouble because most of these large top 10 global pharma companies don't actually do drug discovery anymore. Uh, what they, they do is uh, they help uh, companies with cash. Uh, and they help companies get through regulatory, and they do distribution. But when you're at big internet companies that have more cash than big pharma, they already have the distribution, and regulatory is not that hard. The next step uh, is just going in and putting together their own teams of people to invest in and back drug companies, and then they can actually disaggregate global pharma. Um, and so when we're working with the global CEOs of these, these companies, they don't believe it's, it's possible. Not only is it possible, it's happening. Uh, and uh, because in the end, if you if you're not into the actual discovery, if you're not, you know, if you're not vertically integrated and you're only focused on one area, um, then uh, you're opening yourself up to, to competition. Uh, so for these large groups, I think, uh, you know, I think the banks have sort of figured it out. OK, and financial wants to be the biggest financial player in the world. Apple wants to be big. Google wants to be big. Um, and uh, and uh, so but I don't think, you know, industries like uh, pharma has, has quite woken up to it uh, quite yet. I, I think they're getting a clue, but they're, they're so slow moving uh, that uh, that it's, um, that, uh, you know, I think they're, they're going to find themselves in trouble in very short order. Mm-hmm. Hey, Joy? Yeah, I feel like, you know, I feel like we have a bad cop and good cop combination in session. <laughs> Willem is definitely the bad cop. I'm the good cop here. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so... Um, I, I totally agree. I think we, when we look at you know cross border sectors, which which ones are difficult to penetrate, like multinationally, definitely medical field is one of them. It's considered you know high sensitivity uh, items on the uh, you know U.S. China trade war. There are three of them, actually four of them now. Uh, one of them is you know uh, medical. Uh, the other one is um, chips, right? <laughs> anything, mm-hmm. anything related with chips. 
Um, number three, you know, obviously we know there's a bunch of AI company got blacklisted by U.S. because they, you know they were uh, part of um, you know the the national security for China. <laughs> So that's national security. Anything with that, you know, definitely very worrisome. Um, and also now the other one is probably media. I think you know um, the governments are all trying to control their media. So um, so if you are not part of these four sectors, I would say there's still a lot of room. <laughs> but I, I, this is me being a good cop. But if you're part of that four sectors, yes, that's very. You got to be very very careful. And best your best bet is probably you know. Uh, work with collaborate with uh, already a big unicorn like you know the super apps one of William uh, introduced um, and um, uh, the other thing is actually China is actually in the middle of uh, the how to say like um, the polar that polarization for for companies mm -hmm. so there's these super apps company like Alibaba and Tencent you know I don't know if you guys watching stock market but recently you know they all have dropped. And uh, the reason is, you know, government have stepped in to take more control and be like, you guys cannot be the monopolies this much. For example, like uh, Alibaba is, you know, it's uh, on the media, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's forced to uh, sell off all its media assets because, you know, the government want to control the media. So as a big company like Alibaba, as a retail company like Alibaba, like they want them to just be staying retail. And, you know, don't mess around, you know, <laughs> kind of like uh, try to control the media. So I think there's uh, lots of, you know, um, even though there's, I think it's, there's just really just a cycle of life in anything, just like how the cycle of human life as well. You know, when there's something become really big, um, eventually it's going to, uh, you know, something's going to happen to it. And then, you know, it's going to find a new wave. Um, it's just a natural wave cycle how you know how the universe works so i think right. that's how startups like multinational startups can find you know uh surviving spots through these uh waves and through these sectors especially these sectors and not being watched and not sensitive right uh, sean uh, you have the last words and i come back to summarize sure i'll just uh add uh, sort of a very quick note on the sort of like the multinational cooperation uh, drawing a bit from my involvement with the World Bank throughout these years, uh, you know, we are seeing some cooperation, but they are at very sort of subtle and uh, operational levels, right? It's hard for U.S. and China to decide, okay, we're going to cooperate in, you know, technology or whatever. But, you know, when in my work, you know, at the World Bank helping uh, startups in Kenya, for example, build up uh, payment apps, uh, they definitely are sort of drawing examples from both Alipay uh, and, uh, you know, PayPal. And they're working with, from as far as I know, working with both Chinese and American investors and uh, technologists in trying to identify a solution that would work the best for a market uh, as, as uh, diverse as Kenya. Um, and also, you know, you have a lot of, uh, I think, you know, Stan mentioned, like, you know, Latin America and Africa, right? You have uh, the, the entire startup ecosystem in Latin America and Africa uh, trying to sort of, you know, double dip. They're trying to leverage the benefits and the opportunities and the lessons learned from both the Chinese and American ecosystems. So uh, a lot of the collaboration uh, is happening. Uh, I mean, the governments trying are definitely trying to pull different countries and different groups into their own camps or into their own ecosystems. Mm -hmm. But I think, you know, ultimately at the operational level, uh, you are still going to have a lot of knowledge sharing and a lot of sort of double dipping. And that's, right. you know, Joy mentioned earlier, as long as they're not in military or national security, there still are, are a lot of uh, opportunities. Great. Well, thanks for the uh, panel members. I think it was a very great discussion. I think our time is coming up um, in about one minute. So I want to uh, thank everyone's participation. And of course, this is the beginning of a discussion and you feel free to connect with each one of us if you have further discussions. And, and I think the point is really, let's just use all three keywords, um, competition, collaboration, and cooperation in our discussion, more than just pure competition, because it does make us a lot more um, practical in our, in our use of our daily work. Thanks again for your time, uh, everyone. Uh, we have a pretty good audience here and enjoy the rest of the harassers events. We'll see you hopefully in a few months in person in a China conference as well as the rest of the harassers events as well. Thank you.
Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, nice Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Dylan. Yeah. Sure. Yeah.